on this week's episode of Comics Control as we talk about Mark Millar's new work, Flash Gordon, or Starlight. We also talk about the replayability in video games and how I don't care about it. All that and more on this episode 14. Kyle won't play it. Everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Comics and Controllers. As always, I'm Kyle, joined by my co-host Steven. Hey, how's it going? It's going pretty good, Steven. So, what are we going to talk about this week? Mark Millar has uh, something new in the pipeline. Just came out, and I think we should discuss it. Alright, so what's he got? It's a comic book called Starlight, which is kind of an interesting take on a... Um, superhero who has gone out in space. Uh, uh, he was a test pilot and went through a wormhole of some sort. Ended up halfway across space to become their hero and save a civilization from um, a villain whose name is um, Typh- Typhon, I believe. Um, and now, you know, we have this hero who has uh, returned and it's retirement age you know he he came back he lived his life he did everything that he wanted to do um after being the hero and now he's older his wife has recently passed away which is one of the big events at the start of the comic yep and he's you know kind of seeing that it, it's it's almost in a way like he's seeing it as well all the adventures are over now his kids are grown they have kids of their own, um, you know, like I said, his wife's gone and his kids have their own lives that they're focusing on. And he's kind of remembering the glory days. And, uh, the first issue is really a character piece on, um, our main character here. And now, you know, we're focusing more on him for the first issue, but the end of that first issue sets up what looks like is about to happen for him. I have to just say one thing about this. Okay. Flash. Ah, saved every one of us. Because this is very much Flash Gordon. That's, so you're, you're telling me you're a Queen fan. Is that... Is I know. That I I'm saying that? the story is Flash Gordon. Okay. Well, I, I, I am a Lord. Queen fan. Well, I am I, too. But I'm just saying that it's a Flash yeah. Gordon. That's all it is. Right. And, and you're not wrong. Flash Gordon and said, well, let's look at it 20 years later. You're not, you're not wrong told. at all. Um, and I, I should probably state that I am also a big Flash Gordon fan. It's one of my favorite cheesy movies ever. So what um, did you think of this? Well, there's only one issue, so really you can't right. get a good grasp of the whole story, right. but there's a single issue out. What did you think of it? Okay. I I liked it. I liked it a lot. Okay. And here, here's my argument for this. I really like, as I said, Flash Gordon is one of my favorite like cheesy movies to watch. It's so bad but it does what it's trying to do so well which is a certain genre and it's the over the top you know one outsider coming from earth into this alien civilization and pretty much single handedly saves yeah everybody in this other civilization yeah and he gets all these alien women thrown at him and you know, they want to make him their king and Yeah, I mean there's a they, string of eighties movies that yeah. have this kind of feel yes. to it. Like Last yes. Starfighter is another one. I was just one. thinking that one. Yeah. But you know, the idea is that um he he has the opportunity to stay. He has the opportunity to take a queen and to rule over the people he's just saved and be just an all around awesome dude and it probably would have been a great history, but you know, he left someone he loved back on Earth. And so he goes back, and there is a brilliant scene in this comic, in my opinion, where he's in the grocery store, and a kid, uh, I, I couldn't really tell how old the kid was supposed to be, he looked like he was, you know, almost like preteen. Yeah, yeah, maybe 10 or 11. But he comes up to the main character and asks him if he's the crazy guy who thought he went through a wormhole to save this uh you know, alien race. And then, and then towards the end of the comic, you actually see all the news clippings on his wall with everyone talking about the 
test pilot that returned home, but it's kind of off his rocker and everything. Yeah. So it's kind of neat to see that no one believes that that actually happened to him. But throughout the comic, we have flashbacks that show that, at least in his mind, as far as we know, it did. It really did happen. Yeah. I mean, can't blame people for thinking he's crazy. Just imagine if this airplane that's been missing, if all these people were suddenly found and they all claimed, oh yeah, we went to an alien planet and we saved their whole galaxy. Would you believe right. that? No, you'd think they're all tripping. There is that missing plane in Malaysia right yeah, now. Yeah, that's, so that's what it, I'm referring it, to. Yeah, it could it could happen, or you know. Um, but I'm just saying, like, if that was to happen, can you I blame agree. people for thinking he's crazy? No, and, I, and I'm kind of glad they didn't do the cheap way out, where oh, well, he brought back, you know, a Evidence gun or something. or something to prove, you know. No, I I, I like where it's going. I think okay. this first issue was an amazing setup for. The uh, for the rest of the series, I will say I'm more excited about what's coming and what is going to happen in this series than I was the first issue. But that's that's not really a knock on the issue. I think this had to be done. I think a story like this, this epic nature, requires a setup. So I liked it. I like that when you're in the now, when you're in the present. If you look at the pages, everything is dark and a kind of a tone, uh, a very pale tone to it. And then in any point where he's back on the alien world, it's a lot more colorful. The backgrounds are more, um, you know, more of a fantasy feel. Uh, the actions, like when he's punching um, Typhoon, Typhoid or Typhoon or whatever his name is, he, you know, it, it seems like there's a lot more going on. It, it feels like Mark Millar has done a good job trying to capture this, what he wants to create, even if it is just a, hey, I wanted to write another Flash Gordon uh, book, but I couldn't get the rights to it. But that's more artist stuff. The drawings and everything and the coloring. I mean, I'm sure Mark Millar said, hey, you should try yeah. to do this, but that's more of the the artists, you know, colorers and the whatever behind right. that. Right. I and did then, not think highly of it. I didn't think it was bad, but I didn't think it was anything amazing. It just goes that it goes into my folder of meh Mark Millar comics. I am really sad to hear that because one of the reasons I thought you might actually like this one is because I know a lot of times when you and I discuss Mark Millar, it's the, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but aren't you one of the people that believe that he kind of goes a little over the top with the blood and gore and kind of WTF moments just to, to kind of have a shock value to his stuff? Not so much blood and gore, but yeah, WTF moments he does. And he also likes to, um, hype up his own comics in advance. Like I will never forget when he was writing Wolverine and he had, said in a press release that he was going to, when Wolverine was being mind-controlled by, like, Hydra or somebody, he was going to have Enemy him, of the state, right? Yeah, he was going to have him rape Rachel Summers, thinking she was Jean Grey, and the internet went insane. And what happens is it comes out, and that's not what happened at all. He just basically yeah. said something that he knew was going to cause all the people to run out there and buy the comic, and that's not what happened. So he just hyped up his own numbers. I I, I mean, like I said, it wasn't bad, but I didn't really think it was anything spectacular. It's... It, I mean, it may get better, but from the, a single issue, I would not run out to buy the next one. I would just kind of be like, eh, okay, well, there's another issue. I don't have anything else to read. Maybe I'll take a look at this. I actually thought it was a pleasant... It, it, it still has Mark Millar's fingerprints all over it. Oh, yeah. But I thought it was neat to see something that seemed like he was giving, trying to give it a different tone and a different touch than his usual work. So, for me, this is a... For me, it's a definite, okay, I'll, I will read issue two without any question. Yeah, I was hoping it would be more spacey. I mean, like, there is space stuff, but it's that's not what the story's about. And so I guess maybe I was wanting something more saga-like. Because Saga is really good, and it really does the space stuff very well for comics. Because yeah. I think a lot of comics struggle with that. I mean, DC has its space stuff, and Marvel has its space stuff, but it's in the context of these universes, and they tend to be very just, I don't know, they're yeah. ridiculous is the best way of putting it. Space space books where they actually stay in space and aren't constantly, you know, there's a difference between planet hopping and staying in space. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and obviously this one, he's going to go to a planet, but I don't think they're going to, I don't think for the majority of the series, they're going to go back to earth or back to a kind of a known planet um, other than the one that this centers on. So, so it, it could be good. Another thing that I'm, I'm waiting for 
and because this is a Mark Millar book, is I'm I, I I know this is a mini series. So I'm thinking it's like six issues, maybe a little more, a little less. I think it's going to be um, at least twelve. From what okay. I'm reading. I'm waiting for the, you know, M Night Shyamalan ending where it turns out that he is just crazy. I don't think that's going to happen, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Well, first of all, let me state uh, you what you were just talking about. Um, with some of the stuff he does, it's possible. I don't think so because this book is supposed. You know, he has his own company. It's Malar World. Mm-hmm. It's his own line. Well, this book is supposed to be the beginning of all of the Malar World space books. They're apparently going to have more sp- books that take place in their version of the universe's space stuff, and this is supposed to launch all of that. So I think okay. a lot of these characters and the aliens that they're talking about are going to appear in other comics. And so that would make it harder for that to be the case, but not impossible, obviously. Yeah. It was just a thought I had, knowing the way he writes and the stuff he does a lot of times in comics, is I was like, okay, when, I'm waiting for the big reveal that this guy's just a Looney Tune and none of this is real and all in his imagination, or these are all books he wrote or whatever. Which... It's possible. Yeah. You know, I I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say it couldn't happen. I hope that's not the case. I don't yeah. want that to be the case at all. Uh, part of the, the kind of the cool cheesy factor of Flash Gordon, you know, is that is this earth dude who really had no reason being the guy quote unquote picked to save the universe from, uh, from earth, you know, was running around in his t-shirt and, you know, just doing his thing. And then he comes back and it's not, there's nothing fake about it, you know. It's it, it all happened, and it's almost just like, well, it was another adventure, you know. Yeah, I mean, and I, it probably won't be if that's what they're trying to do is start a whole other line. But just the way Mark Millar writes, he's really bad with endings, I feel. I mean, like, he'll have a great... His stories that are good, the endings usually are pretty terrible. It's I almost will... like he just gave up at the end. He's like, oh, man, i got to write a sixth issue of this. Uh, this happens. I will Same. get back to you on that once I read Kick Ass Three because it's ending very soon and it's supposed uh, to be the it's supposed to be the complete ending for Kick Ass. Like he said that he may do something extra with Hit Girl, but like Dave's story ends here and he's done with it. And that's one thing I give him a little bit of credit for. You know, hopefully he'll stick to his word on that and won't be constantly pulling uh, that stuff up to um, to you know to try to milk it. And I, I don't think he will. I mean, I don't know. It, I think a lot of stuff like that, when it comes to those kind of things, too, it just depends on, hey, I, I'm done with this. All right, but um, we would like this series or this this concept or character or, or whatever. Um, how about we throw more money at you? Would you write for it? I'm willing yeah. to bet. Marmol, you know, not to say that he is, but he is that kind of guy. I mean, I even... Some people within the industry have even joked about that, about him. Like, you know, Mark Millar would write Hitler in a diaper yeah. if you asked him to. And, and sure, and like I said, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope he sticks to his word. But, I mean, in the end, Mark Millar is is a normal, he's a human being. He's a guy who, you know, has bills. They mm-hmm. still come in the mail. And I hate to say it, you know, I've I've read so many interviews with actors and writers and uh, you know other professionals that are just like sometimes you got to pay the bills, sometimes you take the oh, role yeah. because it's a paycheck. Oh you know? yeah, those a lot of actors will say that too. You know, like they ask people like Samuel Jackson, why do you do anything that comes to you? It's like whatever, it's it's money. Yeah. I don't care, you know. Or um, the guy who used to write. What were those uh, fantasy books about the albino time traveling elf? Elric. Elric. El- Elric. Elric. Yeah, Michael Moorcock. Uh, Michael Moorcock. Yes. Yeah, Michael Moorcock. There's a story about him. Like he writes <laughs> legit books, like books that are actually good. But then he writes that that Elric series, which they're pretty terrible. But there's a num. There's a I, lot I of it that's popular. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. And there's a story that the reason he writes those books is whenever he needs to pay a bill. He can crap a book out in a couple hours, send it to his editor, and his editor will basically just publish it because people ne- are going to buy that book, and he'll get his check and go pay his bills. He needs to stop going to Harrods. That yeah, that was his, it was Harrods bills, what he always pays with it. So yeah, it's like, I mean, I understand you have to pay bills, but if you're if you can write, if you're a well written, you know, a writer or whatever, do you really need to kind of 
demean your writing, I guess. It's like an integrity thing to me. Right. One of my stories I always tell in issues like this is J. Michael Straczynski wrote Babylon 5, and it was originally only supposed to be, um, I want to say four seasons, Mm -hmm. but I think they talked him into writing a fifth season. And the thing was that he really felt that at the end of season four, you didn't need anything else or whatever else needed to be done could be done in like a two hour movie. But it was one of the most popular sci-fi shows out at the, when, you know, when this argument came up, because from what I understand, he wrote all of one through four before he even really, they started working on the show. So before they even were done filming season one, he had all four seasons written and TNT came up to him and said, we're going to pay you a huge sum of money to to do this and you know i don't know if at the time he just had extra bills i don't know if he was being greedy i don't i don't think so because i know he's turned down other work since then because he didn't want to do it but he's even said in kind of interviews you can kind of tell that he he doesn't regret doing the last season of babylon 5 but it didn't turn out the way he wanted it and he probably wouldn't have done it had he known yeah but you know that's that's the thing i mean you don't know how it's going to turn out. It could have turned out great, but it probably probably, probably wasn't like uh, t- taking a you know rocket scientist to figure out that he probably should have left it his original um, four se- uh, four season run. But yeah, and uh, you know that kind of goes back talking about people doing stuff for money too. Like we have okay, so in the eighties you had all these kids cartoons. And you had G.I. Joe and He-Man and Ninja Turtles and stuff like that, okay? Those cartoons were initially made to sell toys. They weren't yeah. made because, oh, we've got this G.I. Joe property coming out of Marvel. It's fairly popular. Let's go make a cartoon on it, too. It's like, no, let's make toys, but we need a way to market the toys to kids, so let's make a move. Let's make a TV show, yeah. which, you know, then the movie, too, for it. And same thing was with He-Man and Transformers and all that stuff. They're to market one, toys. One of my favorite ones, Mask was a British toy line that yeah. they just couldn't sell, so they made the cartoon. But to, to go back to that, with the Ninja Turtles stuff, Paul Jenkins, comic book guy, Paul Jenkins was a football-slash-soccer player, okay? And he happened to know the guys who did Ninja Turtles. And he said in a, at a convention that, like, he literally was running a panel called How to Get Into the Comics Industry. He began it with, you don't do it the way I did it. How did you do it, Paul? I got into the comics industry because I knew people. And they hired me because they needed a guy. And then we basically just, once the Ninja Trolls comic took off and we started doing movies and toys, we made a cartoon to market all of it. Yep. And so it's one of those things like... I understand, yes, you're a business. Yes, you're trying to make money. But don't you just cheapen your whole franchise whenever you do that kind of stuff? Like, the Ninja Turtles comics were so good compared to, like... Don't get me wrong, I watched the cartoon as a kid. But now, it has no... It doesn't hold up when the comic still does. You can still read that comic and it'd be good. I will say, yes, that is a comic that still holds up. I I recently reread the first six issues not that long ago. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and there's I'm, a lot of stuff like that. Like, the old G.I. Joe yeah. comics still hold up. The old G.I. Joe cartoon? Yeah, not so much. I'm not as familiar with the G.I. Joe stuff. I will say that I've heard uh, Paul Jenkins tell that story twice now, and both mm-hmm. times it pissed me off even more, realizing how lucky he was to fall into that. Yeah, no, I'm not saying that he, he's not a he's not a good writer, because oh, he yeah, has written some really good stuff, but it is frustrating to hear that he's running a panel that says, this is how you get into comics, but you don't do it the way I did it, because I did it yeah. wrong. He was also hung over when he was at the one that I was at. Somehow he told us. surprised me, yeah. I'm hung over. Liverpool played last night. That's exactly yeah. what he said. But, when... but yeah, I think Mark Millar is, is another, is an example of that. He just, yeah. he, he does stuff like, the Wolverine's gonna rape Rachel Summers. I'm gonna sell a lot of issues this comic. Ha ha, he didn't really do it. He's done that several times with different comics. That's why I think whenever somebody says you should read this Marvel art thing, I'm kind of like, all right. And I read it and I'm just like, yep, still not impressed. I don't understand why so many people are so impressed by what he writes. I just don't think it's that good. There's so many better writers out there. I'm a, I'm a huge Marvel art fan, but I, I never really, when people say they don't like him, it's not like I question it. It's not like when somebody's like, oh, I don't like Straczynski. And I have to kind of go, well, wait, why do you not like Straczynski? If you say you don't like Millar, there are enough reasons out there that I just kind of go, okay. Yeah. I mean, JMS isn't, he's a good writer too. I'm not, 
I don't run out to buy his stuff when he when he comes out though. Right. Like there's certain writers I think most people have there. They're like, oh wow, he's doing this. I'll read it, even if it's a character I don't care about or it's something that doesn't interest yeah. me. I'll at least give it a try. For me, it's Warren Ellis. I like yeah. Warren Ellis a lot. And I get people asking me all the time, why do you like Warren Ellis? Everything he writes is the same. I was like, there's just something about him. I think it was probably my first Transmetropolitan when I read that. That that whole series kind of set up why I like him is he just kind of writes to the balls to the wall. I don't think Ellis himself is the same. I think his tone is always the same. Yeah. Because I remember reading the X-Men, uh, I want to say it was Astonishing X-Men that he did, I believe, because it was called Ghost Box or something. Anyway, his his tone for that comic felt like I was reading a, almost anything else he's ever done, but starring the X-Men. And the writing mm-hmm. was different, and the writing was really good. It's just he has a certain tone that he likes to do his comics in. Yeah, especially when it's tech related, because he's really a big techie. So he loves to do like weird, crazy tech stuff. And a lot of times, if you follow scientific stuff or tech things, and you read a lot of Ellis stuff, if you just if you read an article, you're probably going to see him about some crazy scientific discovery or thing they're doing. You're going to see it in one of his comics in the next year or so. Right. And it's going to have some weird twists. Like, Zero Point Energy is one I always remember. He talked about it. was, like, in the news, somebody was discussing it. And then seven months later, they're, it's in a comic he's writing. They're talking yeah. about using Zero Point Energy. Right. So, yeah. that's but that's just the way he is. And that's what I, and I, I understand that about him. But there's something about his writing. You know? no, and I understand I why a lot of people don't like it. Yeah. So, um, To kind of tie this back to Starlight just a little bit, I will say that there are certain elements that just I knew what uh, Millar was going for. I knew the motif that he was trying to achieve, you know, that he wanted to go through. So, like, when I read that the character's name was Duke McQueen, I was like, that's that's perfect. You know, mm-hmm. it just seems to fit. Also, something that we don't talk as much about on here usually, but um, Goran Parlov is the artist for the book. I like the and, art. Yes, and I will say this. I actually think he's done much better art, and I'm not knocking it. I just I've seen some of his artwork that is just almost uh, to the level of amazing, so you should uh, Google some of his artwork. But in this book, I think a lot of the art direction and a lot of the styles and tones and the facial expressions. He did a really good job with the facial expressions in this book. Yeah. I, uh, so so I think that's a draw for this book. And and you know, um, Millar usually works with some really some really talented people. If you've never read Wanted. Part of the reason Wanted was so good, in my opinion, is he had J.G. Uh, Jones. I think it's J.G. Jones doing the artwork, and mm-hmm. I loved it. But overall, I I'm, I like the first issue, but I, I'm really wanting to see where they go. I'm wanting to see what they do, how they handle certain aspects of taking this old and should-be-retired hero who, as far as we know, when he did all this, was just a normal guy. I mean, we haven't been to the planet. Maybe... Maybe it's like the Superman effect that for some reason when he's on their planet, he gets powers. I have no clue. Yeah. But I, I'm interested to see how they do a lot of this stuff and if he keeps up the the you know the whole theme and motif that he's been doing. It, I mean, like I said, I'm not going to rush out to buy it, but I'll be interested to see. Mostly because I want to see if what I think is going to happen happens. <laughs> that he's a nut. <laughs> I, I will be interested to see it. I just I hope that's not the case. Yep. All right, so on from comics to controllers. Stephen, what are we talking about on the controller side? Um, well, recently I've been playing through some older games, and one thing that you know always sticks out to me and something I, I talk about a lot is replayability. And I think replayability is something that's really important, but as you get a little bit older and you you know, don't have as much free time, replayability kind of falls to the wayside a little bit. Um, There are so many times where either I just don't have the time to sit through and do all the side quests or find all the collectibles of something, you know, and I, or or I'm I'm, I'm playing something to write an article on it. So I'm just trying to get through it. So, and I don't go back and replay through. All right. So when you play a game, say an example of games like Grand Theft Auto five. Yeah. Okay. Grand Theft Auto five is probably one of these ones that has like, a billion collectibles and side missions and all this stuff. Tons of side quests. Uh, the online is gigantic. We're not even talking about online. We're yeah, just talking that, yeah, about... Not, not even talking like that, really. Just talking about yeah. that kind of stuff. All right, when you play those yeah. kind of games, 
do you try to do all of those side quests and find all the collectibles and get 100%? No. Okay. I, I, I do not have the time for that. <laughs> okay. But at some um, point you're like... Or, or the would. patience. Oh, when I was younger, uh, before okay. college, pre-college, I, I bought a game. And because I, you know, I, I had a job at most of that point because um, I've had jobs on and off since I was like 12. And what part of the thing, you know, is you spend the $60 or how much ever on a game, you want to make it last for the money. Mm -hmm. And you also don't have an infinite supply of money. So you have these same nine or 10 games you want to go back and keep playing. Um, you know, uh, that's you, you wanted games with high replay value. You wanted games that you could play over and over and over again. It's probably why I have Mario three memorized almost. Yeah. And when, uh, when you talk about replay, Billy, you're not talking about like getting a sports game or a fighting game or something like that. I mean, those right. inevitably have replayability. It's the whole concept right. of those games. You're yes. talking about something like I'm going to play back through, like you said, Mario brothers three, or I'm going to play back through yeah. grand theft auto vice city or something like that. Right, I'm, I'm not talking right. about stuff like MMOs or The Sims or yeah. anything that's designed for replay value. I want to focus kind of on story-driven games that yeah. um, usually people would mostly think one playthrough or whatever. See, that's that, where I'm, that have I more. Have. Yeah. If there's a story game, example would be like, um, I've recently, uh, well, not recently, but in the last couple of months, you know, I played through like, uh, the Blood Dragon thing for Far Cry 3. Right. There's a ton of stuff I could have done more with it, but once I saw the ending, I was done, uninstalled, never going to play it again. I, yeah, well... I and mean, I, I'm fine with that. And I'm also bad because sometimes if I'm like, I don't have a lot of time to play this game, but I want to see the ending, I will rush through it and I will skip stuff. Like, yeah. uh, there's some side quests. I don't want to do those. I'll just skip them because I want to get to the end. Like, the Batman Arkham Origins game... Yeah. There's a lot of side stuff that when I finally get back to playing that game, I will probably not do because I just want to see the big ending. I'm not worried about like getting some special like, power up or something or a new costume or any of that stuff. It doesn't really bother. It doesn't really interest yeah. me. And if you actually took the time to look up what you have to do for those extra costumes, you would probably say screw it anyway. And 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 that's probably true. There's very few games I think I've been all about collecting everything. One of them was probably Assassin's Creed 2, where it's like you get all of the video clips. Yeah. That was probably the last game that I was like that with. Did you get all of Altair's armor? Yeah. See, I, I started that, and I, I think I only got... Two or three pieces. Assassin's Creed 2, I was really into. In fact, the only one of those things I didn't complete were the feathers, and that's because that's stupid. That That is stupid. I agree. <laughs> you know, and, and the only other ones were some of the Elder Scrolls games. Like, uh, those games I would just get so involved in, and, you know, I'd put 200 yeah. hours into Skyrim or Oblivion. Right. Well, that, that's, that's kind of what I want to get to, and... Um, I've written about this a lot for different articles, but okay. part of the reason why it kind of came back up this week is I finally sat down and beat the 2013 version of Tomb Raider, um, which I, I believe you have played also, correct? Yes. Well, one of my big problems with it was I loved the game. I enjoyed it. I thought it had some kind of weird mechanical choices, but other than that, I loved the weapon and weapons and the combat system. And part of what you can do is collect items to upgrade your weapons. You can get all these different add-ons and stuff that improve your weapons. It's a lot of fun to me. So when I got to the end and I beat the game, I you know I really enjoyed the ending. And I go back and I realize there's no type of New Game Plus mode. There's nothing that allows you to keep all your upgrades and play through the game again. And I don't get that. I don't understand... Uh, why that was a thing. And for those who don't know what I mean by New Game Plus, Batman's a great example. Once you have beaten Batman and you've upgraded all your abilities and stuff like that, you get to start the game over, but you keep all your upgrades. Or, mm -hmm. in the case of Batman, there's also another option where I believe um, in New Game Plus, to make it harder, you don't get the warnings for countering. So it makes the game more challenging. Any type of New Game Plus mode usually gives a game 
some replay value because if you enjoyed the game the first time through and you especially if it's a game like Batman or Tomb Raider where the combat system was really good and wasn't annoying you you're probably going to want to go through it again and I would have loved to have gone through Tomb Raider again with all my upgraded weapons and I didn't get to finish upgrading everything so I could have still gone through and still been update upgrading more but there's no way to do that yeah and see to me that doesn't even that doesn't even register for me on my radar of for a game like if it's gonna make me buy it like I beat Team Raider and as soon as I beat it once again uninstalled it because I was done with it I was like right. oh that was a good game really fun I'm not gonna play it anymore because I'm playing the game for the story right and and, that, and once that I've got the story why well, play it again it's like you know it's fun leads, but it's not that fun <laughs> right that leads into my next point some stories are so good that you want to play through it again. And maybe this, it, maybe you're the outlier in this I've case. I've never had a game that was story driven that I've played through multiple times. And, and I'm going to say right now, it's it's rare for me. There, there are games I've replayed because I've liked the mechanic a lot. Uh, Batman: Arkham City is a great example. The story was great; it was amazing. But really, I, I replayed it because I love the combat system in Arkham City. See, that doesn't even that's not even a reason for me to replay. That yeah. just doesn't interest me. Like, once I've beaten a game, it is, I'm done with it. I don't even want to play it again. Like, the only exceptions for games that I replay are things like an MMO. But right. then it's more like I'm leveling a different type of character. So it's still yeah. a little bit different gameplay. Or that, Minecraft. Like, it's a new world I'm starting over. But I've done all this before on another world. So it's still really the same game. And to me, that's almost a completely different world in this discussion. Yeah. Um, but, like, to me... Uh, two games that come on you know, top of my head, I started playing Bioshock Infinite again because I love the setting, I love the world. The story was so good, in my opinion, that it was very much worth playing again. And, you know, it's one of those games that it's simple kind of first-person shooter mechanic with some added flair, but, man, I, I kept, you know, even going through it again, I kept remembering, oh, this part's about to come up, and, you know, this is about to happen, and I'm about to meet these people, and I kept wanting to go back and rush through it. Same thing with Half-Life 2. I love Half-Life 2 a lot. I even, for those who know me, I have a vision problem, and so the end of Half-Life 2 was hard for me because the, the main bad guy, every time you hit him, he puts out a blinding light, and I actually had trouble doing the last boss. I actually had to get someone to help me the first time. Mm-hmm. But I love the story so much, and the game itself just, you know, was so fun because I liked what was going on that I I went through it. See, I think part of it for me, too, is it's like I have so little time to play games that when I play a game, I want to go through it, get to the end, and then... My, my thought is, oh, I've got another game now I should play. I shouldn't go back to this one I've just beaten. I should go try this new game. You know, yeah. like, I beat Tomb Raider. Okay, I'm done with it. Maybe I should go play the new Hitman game because I want to play it too. And I beat yep. it, so maybe I should move on to um, Shadow Warrior and so on yep. rather than and, go back and replay one of them. And, and I agree. That's definitely, you know, there, I, 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 like I said, there's so many times I finish a game and I'm like, well, I played this game because I wanted to and because I wrote this article on it. Well, I'm done with that, so uninstall, like you said. Yeah. But there are other things, like some games just the characters are so good. Does They're, DLC bring you back to a game? Not often. Yeah. See, that's every, how every I now am. Then. Every I now and then. I very rarely play DLC, even if I love the game. Like, you know, I loved Skyrim, and I played the heck out of it. I've not touched a single piece of DLC. Yeah. I've bought all the DLC. I've downloaded and installed all the DLC. Never done any of it. Just because it's like, oh, I gotta go through all this again. I've already done this, and my character is so ridiculous right now that I could just decimate anything I have to come across. So it's like, I should start over, but oh my god, I don't want to do this whole game again. So, yeah. I mean, well, Bioshock that... Infinite might be one of the only ones that I do the DLC, so. Yeah. And that'll be interesting because it's not even really the same story, but that leads to the game I was gonna mention for great characters, and that's one I played recently The Last of Us. And The Last of Us, the story was pretty simplistic once you had the setup, uh-huh. but the two main characters were amazing. And part of that is because they had two very good voice actors. Uh, Troy Baker, who was uh, the Joker recently in Arkham Origins, did the main voice for Joel in The Last of Us. And it, it was an amazing... That was a story that was told between two characters. And that, to me, is worth revisiting. Also, 
I actually played the DLC for that one because it had Ellie, you know, who is uh, the the main female character, yeah. and then it introduced a new character that in a little bit over two hour DLC, I felt like I knew just as well as Ellie almost. How much was that DLC? That's the problem. Yeah, I was about to say because for two hours, if if it's what I think it was, that was way too much money. It was it was fourteen ninety nine for two hours. Okay, it's which cheaper than I thought it was. But it's still too much. No, that's too much. That's way too much. And honestly, I'm, I almost didn't buy it. If the game was not so good, that they would not have gotten my money. It's still not as bad as the Elder Scrolls Oblivion horse armor for nine dollars. <laughs> That was the that was like the epitome of bad DLC. Yeah, armor for your and, horse that's ten dollars, and the horses are so terrible in that game nobody used them. And, and I feel fast travel. I feel so bad for anyone that actually paid that amount of money for that because the horse armor DLC ended up being free on the game of the year edition, mm-hmm. and eventually they did a big uh, on the Xbox at least, and I think on PC they did a big sale on the different DLCs, and that one they were giving away for free. See, that's why I very reluctantly buy DLC when it first comes out, because I know if I give it, you know, a couple months or wait till a Steam sale, I'll be able to get it all dirt cheap. Like, I didn't buy Skyrims individually, but when they were all out, you could buy them all as a bundle for really cheap on Steam, and I did. And that's when it was worth it. So. Yeah. But Um, I don't... you still talking about like the character driven? Even good characters don't bring me back. I mean, it's to me, it's just I'm done with this game. I don't really want to play it again. I don't have the time to invest in this game a second time. Right. Well, what about games that give you um, other options? Like a great example is Mass Effect, because you can not only play through as a Paragon, but you can also play through as Renegade. Or nah. see one of my examples. And what I liked was Hitman, and you kind of brought this up earlier. One of the coolest parts about Hitman is that you can kill people in different ways in almost every mission. Yeah. And it's a lot of it's environmental kills or how, you know, you trying to be better. Like, one thing, if you ever watch me play Hitman, if I screw up just a little bit, it's fine. The minute I screw up to where it's a little bit more than I'm willing to accept, I start the, the level over. Uh, see, for me... Those kind of games where you get a different ending based on what you do or stuff like that, I will go through my way. If I'm like, I'll decide, like, this guy's going to be a bastard and I'm just going to do the worst stuff ever, I go through it. And I never look back because my thought is, is that was my story for this game. I don't want the other side. It'd be cool. It's cool to talk to people, though, when you ask them, like, so what happened when you did this? Oh, no, that's not what happened when I did it. It gives me a unique experience, and I like yeah. that. And I don't want to have the other side of it. I don't mind talking about it, but I don't want to go and experience it. Like, I have a friend who, if she likes a game, she is going to do and see everything she can in the game, like Dragon Age. She yeah. beat Dragon Age with every possible ending, every possible way, you know, those kind of things, even games that are collectible based like Lego, all those Lego games, she will get 100% on all of those. And that means that some of those games you have to play four and five times all the way through to get all those collectibles. And yeah. she'll do it because she likes the game that much. Me, once I'm done, I'm done. Even if that means yeah. I'm only 10% through with the game, if I've seen the conclusion, then I don't want to play it anymore. Yeah, And, and I know people like that. And um, Now, what I'll do is if it's a game I really like, I'll play through to get the different endings, but percentage percentage values mean nothing to me i don't i don't care about having a game 100 percented but like a great example is um heavy rain you know i really liked heavy rain and it had about 14 different end yeah. sequences so i beat the game twice and then whatever end sequences i uh hadn't finished it that i hadn't seen at that point i just youtubed because i wanted to see it i wanted to know what the other sequences were but you know it like Assassin's Creed was a great example. I'm, there's no reason for me to worry about getting that 100. percent It's just oh, yeah. a number. It, it's not even to me. It's not even a great bragging number. And you know too, like a story, like you talked about Mass Effect earlier. A game like Mass Effect, I played Mass Effect One and I loved it. Even when a lot of people didn't like Mass Effect One, I still really enjoyed it. Mass Effect Two was so amazing. I played a lot in that, and I I didn't get 100, percent but I made sure that like when I beat that game, I didn't lose anybody. Everybody yeah. survived. When Mass Effect 3 came out, I bought it, day one. I didn't get to play it immediately, and then I started hearing all the bad stuff about it. 
that legitimately made me never want to play that game. And so eventually, my friend was up here, and she was like, go ahead and play it, because she had already beaten it. So she's like, I'll help you through it so we can get through it fast and get you the good stuff. Okay, once she left, and I still hadn't finished the game, I never beat it, got rid of it. I didn't want it. I didn't care, because I knew the ending was going to be disappointing. Because I knew it, it, my ending was not going to depend on what I did throughout the game anymore. So I didn't really give a damn. So uh, hearing about a bad ending to a game or a bad story is enough to make me not want to finish it. Yeah. And that Mass Effect is the epitome of that. Like, I don't even care anymore about that series. So. Well, um, part of your comment also kind of leads into my next one, and that's playing games like uh, Hitman is a great example and instead of just deciding whether to be good or bad with your character, is deciding whether to be stealth-based or if you're going to be uh, balls-to-the-wall action, running up and shooting people. And two, yeah. very, two very good examples of that are Dishonored and Deus Ex Human Revolution. And yeah. I, I will say this. I, I, I beat Deus Ex Human Revolution going very gun-heavy. I went um, high hacking and high gun. And so I, you know, I was very upfront and in your face. And I think I started another playthrough where I was trying to focus on stealth. And I think I went stealth and hacking again because hacking is just so valuable in that game. Yeah. Um, but Dishonored, I was the exact opposite on. I started trying to play stealthy and it upset me so much at so many different points that I decided, screw that. I'm just going to kill everything I see. I got the bad ending. And so I just went and I, I YouTube the good ending because I did not care to go back to try to be stealthy because you yeah. have to be stealthy to get the good ending on that one. See, Dishonored's one of those games that like I'm playing through it and I, I liked it in the beginning and then about an hour and a half in I realized that the game was ridiculously repetitive and the story wasn't going anywhere and I just gave up on it and yeah, never that, wanted to play it again. That world had so much potential and they just... For me, stuff know. like that what makes what is so good nowadays are let's plays so like yeah. i wanted to play the new thief game right yeah I, then I, I actually do want to play it i'm going to play it at some point yeah. oh but i heard it is it's very linear it's not free out range so it's kind of yeah. you know it's it's not what i wanted so i'm like i don't want to play anymore but i can watch other people play it and yeah. i can still get the story from it and in that aspect it's like a movie to me plus i can get their commentary depending on the person that's worth it you know and and that's kind of what I do with other stuff. Like an example is, what was the game from the guy who did Heavy Rain, the one that Ellen Page was in? Beyond Two Souls. Beyond Two Souls. Okay, I wasn't going to play Beyond Two Souls because it didn't sound like it was interesting to me. But I watched somebody let's play it, and it was good. And he also put up a video for each one of the endings. So if it's like you went through it with them and you would have chose something different in the end, then he you could go to that video and watch it. That was cool because then I could watch all the endings and I didn't have to go through this game or play this game. Because it was not, and I even told the guy, I'm like, that is not a game I would have played. But the story yeah. was interesting enough that I'm glad I watched it because it was like a movie, you know. So right, and like and talking I about agree. games with replayability, that one had zero. Yeah, I. It's so story driven that once you're done, there is no yeah. reason to play that game. That game should have been twenty dollars. Well, I also heard that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I remember reading that one of the things that they said, you know, when we just talked about this, that gave. Um, Heavy Rain replayability was there were so many different endings and so many different ways a lot of that stuff can come about. Well, apparently it was a little more streamlined in Beyond. I think there were only like three different endings or something like that. Uh, no, there weren't as many endings as in Heavy Rain, but I think there was still like five or six. Oh, okay. Wow. All right. Well, I don't know. It wasn't as many. Like you said, there's like 14. There was maybe, it was between well, four and six. It was it, not it, as many. Here's the thing. There, when Heavy Rain ends, you have four main characters. So each main character has a potential of like, uh, I think, four to five. Because some have four and some have five uh -huh. um, different endings. So you, you've got a base like 16 ending clips. And depending on what decisions you made the game and how well you did in certain parts, it, it depends which of those clips you get. But like I said, some characters also have five instead of four. Okay. So anyway, um, but that, that makes sense. And, and I can, that's, that is one reason Let's Plays are good. Um, another reason Let's Plays are good is for side stories, like side quests. And uh, 
Oh yeah, you know, side story stuff like in Grand Theft Auto. Exactly. There's some stuff I eventually went back and did, but there were a couple that I was just like, man, I don't, I don't want to waste my time doing all these missions to yep. get to one cutscene. So I went, you know, again to the YouTubes to see, you know, that. Or my thing is, I played Fallout, right? And I never beat Fallout. It was just mm-hmm. too much to do. Um, Fallout 3 is the one I'm referencing, but I, I heard Vegas was not as good, but it still had some decent stuff. Yeah. And, you know, Skyrim, and uh, well, you mentioned earlier, all uh, Oblivion. There are people, I, I've seen people's hours spent on Oblivion, and it's ridiculous. It's like more time than most people put into WoW. I, yeah, I, I put over, when I played Oblivion, I put over 180 hours into it. That's not DLC. That's yeah. 180 hours. I had yeah. every achievement on the 360 for that. And some of those achievements were just time-consuming. But I was so into that game. I mean, it, I went through four Xbox 360s playing that game. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> so, And I put a lot of time in Skyrim also. Not nearly as much, though, because I didn't have as much free time as I did back then. But one last question, because we're running a little late here. Yeah. I had a, This goes back to the Let's Play stuff. So if you watch a Let's Play of somebody playing a game, Actually, it's two questions. First question is, do you watch a Let's Play the game that you are currently playing or going to play, or do you choose not to watch those? I uh, I watch games that I want to play, but I'm not going to have time. Okay. Or, or a great example is I watched an entire, I think I watched two Let's Plays of uh, Dead Rising 3 mm-hmm. because I, I wanted to see the game. But it's going to be a while before I get an Xbox One, so I, I just knew I wasn't going to play it anytime soon. Um, I, I started watching One Stick of Truth for the South Park game, but as soon as I realized it was good, I quit watching it because I, I'm like, I'm going to get that game, so yeah. I want to go ahead and. Uh, okay, um, and, I'm, and I'm I'm the same way on that. Yeah. Um, also, that's another good one. Sorry, harping back to YouTube, uh, games with level creators give it a lot of replayability. Far Cry, Time Splitters are two good examples of. Uh, first-person shooters that give their own level creators. So you have, you know, a first-person shooter, the story-driven, like Far Cry and Far Cry 3. I don't know if 2 had the level creator. But then you can make your own multiplayer maps using stuff from the single player and stuff like that. Yeah. And that, I think that's a good one. That's why Gary's Mod gets so much YouTube time now, because yes. there's so many created levels and so many created games people have done is that, like, it just, you know, it, it's totally different. And the last thing, uh, again, one more time tying it back to Let's Plays, is the boss battles. Um, I love any game with good boss battles. I have always been a giant advocate for, hey, take your time on a boss battle, because that's those are the memorable moments from games. There are so many Zelda games, Ocarina of Time especially, that I've gone back and played because I loved fighting the bosses so much in that game. But the one that I want to kind of shine a light on here is, did you ever play Shadow of the Colossus? Um, I did, but I didn't play a whole lot of it. I mean, that game's nothing but boss battles. Yes, and I think it was an amazing idea because the, the basically the idea is, you know, the story's so simple. It's like, hey, we need these uh, 12 soul shards to resurrect your dead girlfriend or whatever. So there are these 12 colossi out there. They're all giant, differently shaped bosses, and it, they're really jumping puzzles and, you know, maneuvering puzzles to get... Mm-hmm to a certain spot, but you also have to find the weak points on the Colossi before you can even really do a lot of that stuff. It's an amazing game. It's a Mm -hmm. depressing game because it's very, so very Japanese. But one of the things that I loved is watching YouTube videos of people doing the same bosses that I did and then watching them do something completely different that I never thought to do. Or that yeah. I was like, oh, I didn't even see that that ledge was even up there. I went all the way around to get to the boss's head. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, that is pretty cool to watch. Dark Souls is another one that's good to watch for that. because. Right. But th- the problem with doing it for Dark Souls is like once you know how to beat stuff, then the game is ridiculously easy. It's, the, it's your first run through of that game that makes it so frustrating. <laughs> And why you, it's so hard. But once you learn how to do things, it's not that bad. But, yeah, I usually, if it's something I plan on playing, even if it's, like, my favorite YouTuber, I'm not going to watch it. Unless yeah. it is something that we could each play it 
and it work a little bit different. You know, like yeah. a great example is I'm going to play Grand Theft Auto Five eventually. When, sure, you should. When time shows up out of nowhere for me to play it, I'm planning on doing it. But I've watched a, uh, one person's let's play of it, but he only one guy's because he's he's really funny with it. And so I followed him all the way through, and he's near the end, and now he's doing all the side quests, which is cool because, like you said, I'm not going to do the side quests, yeah. but he is because he's he needs more videos. <laughs> there you go. But so. Stuff like that, I'll watch. But something where there's not going to be any kind of difference between your play and my play of it, but I want to play it, I'm not going to watch it. You know, uh, like the South Park one, I'm not going to watch any videos on that. Because I want to play it, and I've been told one thing, it's super easy. That Somebody basically told me, like, if you die while playing this game, you are the worst video gamer ever. It's not <laughs> It's it's not that. It's a story thing. And there's not a lot of differentiation. Like, you may do some stuff that's a little bit different, but the story's the same for everybody. So I'm like, I'm not going to watch people play that anymore. Plus, most okay. people stop playing it because of... There comes points in it where, like, you have to edit so much that if you don't, YouTube will probably ban your channel. Yeah, no, yeah, that's... A lot of YouTubers I, who I knew who were doing it all stopped doing it because they're like, yeah, I reached a point where it's like I can either just edit down for, like, hours or just not do it, and I'm just not going to do it. I'm just going to play it. That so. that makes sense. That I, I can totally understand that. But all right, then, so replayability. I don't yeah. care, but Steven does. That's the final <laughs> verdict. That's, I was about to say, so what we've learned today is that Kyle, for pretty much no reason will replay a game even if it's damn good yeah i mean the only things i replay are stuff where it's stuff like minecraft or uh, rts or fighting games or sports games yeah. or stuff like that things that are meant to be replayed right I, but any adventure rpg slash you know story driven game i'm very unlikely to ever touch once i've beaten it yeah we could have i'm very entire... unlikely to beat them truthfully because <laughs> i've just don't have the time for it, but it's it's like why I cannot make myself beat Final Fantasy Thirteen for whatever reason. Uh, I didn't beat that because it was boring. Yeah, but uh, we could have an entire separate conversation on what makes games like, um, you know, like you said, MMOs, fighting games. I played a lot of Dynasty Warriors, which is really just some to some people some of the most not monotonous things it, it, that's me. out there. But I loved it. Um, I still kind of do love it. I just haven't bought them in a while because they come out with like one a year, and I got tired of doing that. The wrestling games. I play yeah. a lot of the wrestling games. I actually, this year is the first year I have not bought a wrestling game. But yeah, that sounds like something we could talk about on another show. In fact, yep. if it sounds interesting to you and you'd like to hear us talk about it, email us and let us know. Let us know your opinion on it. So you can email us at comicsandcontrollers at gmail.com. Let us know if you want to hear us talk about what makes some games replayable, like MMOs and stuff like that. Um, if you want to follow me, you can follow me on Twitter, at ZombieJesus here. And where can they follow you, Stephen? Uh, on Twitter as well, um, at Stephen uh, Wilds. Uh, it's just my name spelled out. Also, I do do, uh, since we brought it up, my own YouTube videos, and it's uh, YouTube user Serenity's Bane. So there you go. We can link that also so you can... You can check them out. If you're, yep. In fact, if you're checking this out on YouTube, I think these are coming out on your channel, so that, you should be seeing true. us come through there. Right. All right, then. Well, so until next time, I'm Kyle. And I'm Steven. You guys have a good one.